Okay, so earlier this week I met somebody. I want to talk about that and what they spoke to me about. And then two, I want to talk about uh, my epiphany that I had on Sunday. It's funny, it's actually like what you were already doing when I walked in and you called in conversation. Cool. And uh, my seven minutes of power is what I call it. And uh, so let's rewind it back. So what happened was I got a call from my brother last week and I had showed him the video. I tagged him. the guy, Jermaine White, that I tagged in on the thing. And he finally watched it and he was like, man, that was amazing. That's something I want to be a part of, what you're doing. And he has a hard spirit uh, like mine. He wants to help in community. But for some reason, God has put in his heart uh, a business mind that we're supposed to be in business together and we're mm-hmm. supposed to be doing something great. And it's like some, being pregnant with something. It's like you can't explain it. But you just know. Yeah. It's like the knowing is so burning inside of you, like you know you're supposed to be running a business. You're supposed to be elevated. You're supposed to be in a whole different way, place than where people see you at right now. And it's like being living a life of a double agent. Like you know who you are, but nobody else knows who you are now. But you know it's coming. And so after you watched the video, he's like yeah, Paul, that's exactly what we need to be doing. I want to follow you in this direction. Well, then the next day after he watched the video, he got a, a friend named Thad called and said he wanted to stop by. And so out of coincidence, he said, my father-in-law needs to come. He wants to come by. He's going to come by with me. So after my brother met his father he calls me immediately and said, hey, you need to go meet this guy. I don't know what it is. You just need to go meet this guy. My brother was like very adamant that I need to go meet this guy. And so I go meet this stranger, never met him before. He was from Houston, originally from right now. He's living in Houston, but he's from Chicago. And when I met him, we started off having a casual conversation. And I was just telling him a little about, a bit about the things that uh, I wanted to do and the things I was trying to do uh, with the program and trying to build and how I wanted to change the community. They couldn't find out everything that I wanted to do was everything that he had already had been done in Chicago. <clears throat> and all the programs that I wanted to start was everything he had already previously done mm-hmm. in Chicago. <clears throat> and so it was no coincidence. And so right now, uh, what he was doing was he runs a, a media company that they go out and do promotions, that they go out and target and promote different businesses, but they gear up for churches and for nonprofits. The, the put the the awareness that what they're doing and what's going on mm-hmm. and so they can bring in the people that is needed for whatever function that someone may be having and so he switched into the media side of it mm. and so as me and him are having this conversation we're talking he said man it's crazy to speak to you and your brother because it sounds like i'm speaking to the same person he said because neither one of y'all speak in forms of what you're doing now he said, y'all always speak about the future, like y'all already living it and y'all already know what's going to happen. And so as we're having this conversation, all of a sudden he said, man, the spirit just came over me. I need to tell you something. I said, well, I receive it. Just tell me exactly what, tell me what you have to say. I'm, I'm an open-minded person. He says, I have to tell you that whatever you've been through, You've been through so much pain. I never told him about anything I've been through. I never told him about the abuse or anything else. He never touched it. He said, all the pain that you've been inflicted throughout your whole life will be the testimony to save so many other lives. He was like, right now you put yourself in a box that you think you're about to save kids. He said, but no, you're building yourself to save whole families Hmm. and build families back together. He said, and when you don't want to think you're going to ever go back into the pulpit. He says, you're going there, but in a different direction. Mm -hmm. He says, and then he said, I seen the vision too, that there's about to be millions of dollars flowing through your hands. 
he says, and you're about to not just employ yourself, you're about to employ many people through these business transactions. He said, but I also see that you're not going to have a business. You're going to have a multitude of businesses, and I also see you being a great investor. He said, so I see you're about to become, and I never talked to him <coughs> anything about money, about business. I never told him that anything that I wanted to go into mm-hmm. business. I never spoke to him. And the only person that ever spoke to me in that facet of way was that first time me and you met. Right. And you said, Paul, it's something that I'm just hearing, that mm-hmm. if you get the stage, that's all you need and everything else, that something great is about to happen. And, you're like, and so it was overwhelming for the first time for someone to speak in existence, which you already know is built inside of you. But nobody else sees it because they only see what they see what's in front of. Mm-hmm. They don't see, they see the man that they see in front of, but they don't see the vision of where he's about to take you or what he's he's putting inside of you, that he's birthed inside of you or that you're already pregnant with. But it's like, and like I was thinking about it today at work, it's like being too much pregnant, but because you're not showing mm-hmm. Nobody thinks you're pregnant with anything, but you know inside that you have something living inside of you, and in the nine months it's going to be there. But nobody else can see what's mm-hmm. inside of you at that period of time, and so that was something that was very, very moving, and very, and, and made me even more hungrier, and, and and the desire to do what was already calling into existence what I'm supposed to be doing. And my visions that I've had years and years ago, years and years ago, so speaking to 7,000 people and, and speaking to the large crowds and audiences and, and things of that nature and and being who I was called and destined to be. And just, like, even like just listening to your calls and things like that, and like it was just so inspiring because whatever is in you, like just going back to like what you were saying, what happens to us now that we can just pick it back and just talk mm-hmm. in general, you hit the nail on the head. What happens is when you're first born, even what the Bible says, it says have faith of a child. But the reason why he says that because that the faith of a child believes that it can fly. Mm-hmm. A faith of a child believes that it can be a police officer, it believes it can be a doctor, it believes it can be a lawyer, it believes it can be a painter, it believes that it can create out of this imagination. That when we were kids, we would go out and all we needed was a crate. <laughs> all we needed was a crate and a flat and a flat ball, and we could play basketball all day long. All up some paper. All all paper. paper. <laughs> Wouldn't matter. All we needed, we had, we had the least, but we had the most. <laughs> yeah, you right. We didn't need the sixty dollar video games <laughs> to entertain us. Our imaginations entertained us. Mm-hmm. And we didn't have to have money to entertain us. It was just a pure childlike imagination that you lose through abuse, through through the through the things that we see, the things that we hear, the things that we touch, our five senses of life that we start gravitating to. And then it builds those things of teaching of fear. And then when that fear dominates and then we lose that child who used to believe in Santa Claus and the tooth fairy and the thing. (laughs) (laughs) Santa Claus is real, buddy. Yes, he is. Yeah, yeah. I got a picture of me being Santa Claus yesterday. That really happened. That really happened. I'm on a weight loss journey, so they constantly be pictures of of Santa Claus to remind me. Yeah, don't eat that. That's this is this is a meal right now. Okay. Uh, (laughs) I'm in the same boat, and even with the, and I get into that too because that's something else that uh, I was talking about exercising. And I got recommended in a whole different way of what I was thinking. And 
that was so key in like what you're telling that we we exist mm -hmm. but we really don't exist in what others tell us mm -hmm. and if you only exist as of what somebody speak into you of who you are mm -hmm. then you'll never know mm -hmm. you'll never know i mean and like even for me, just just a small example for for me, my grandfather used to say, "Oh, you're gonna be just like your dad. You're gonna be just like your dad. You're you're gonna be nothing just like that. You're gonna be doing trust like your dad." And then so long, next thing I know, I'm in high school, yeah, and I'm doing drugs, yeah, just like that. But that's all I was told. Yeah, that's all I was spoken into me. And and then as a child, you're never told that you can speak life into yourself. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm. Okay, sir. Mm. And so, when you're you're so brainwashed by what the world tells you, it tells you stop dreaming. Mm. And the reason why it tells you stop dreaming because it doesn't know how to dream anymore. No. Mm. And so, just like uh, this mom says, you have a whole island you have a whole cemetery full of dead dreams and dead millionaires who never got a chance to spend the fortune that they could have had or should have had if they would have kept dreaming if they would have stopped denying themselves to live and i think when i spoke to that man it gave me a resonation of that child again to say you know what i can be peter pan again mm -hmm. Uh, and, and that's the, the, the thing that the world doesn't want you to be Peter Pan. Yeah. It doesn't want you mm -hmm. to, to believe that you can fly. It don't want you to have a happy thought. Mm -hmm. See, because mm -hmm. Never Neverland... In order to fly, you have to think of a happy thought. Yeah. So it, it, it kills us with nothing but hatred and division. Mm -hmm. And segregation. And lies. Hey, it works for our president. <laughs> <laughs> but in general, but that's where it resonates. It's like, okay, Paul, I've done so many sacrifices because I got talking to a coworker today, and he was like, uh, and I was just telling him, I was like, man, I got something I have to do. And I was like, I've given up a lot not to do it. I've given up opportunities to get jobs that's going to easily pay me $100,000 a year. And I keep turning them down. But the reason why, look me sideways. She just counting your money, that's all. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but for me, the 100,000 means anything if I'm not in my purpose being there. Mm -hmm. I can, 100,000, I'd have made 100,000 before. And if, and if it was fun. But, but not being in your purpose in that 100,000, not being able to look at that person in the mirror and be like, I made this 100,000 doing what I love. Being that kid again is an empty 100,000. Yeah. Because it brings you right back to like I was saying to being on the street corner and playing. When you played, it didn't matter if you had a huffy go. It didn't matter what kind of goal or if it was the most expensive one that you had at Academy. That didn't matter to you. <clears throat> just uh, just the, the pure joy of playing mm -hmm. was all that mattered. But now, as we got to the society that tells us that this is what you need. This is what you need to exist. And if you don't have this to exist, then you're nothing. Yeah, I and so I just really feel like after <clears throat> sitting down with that gentleman and him speaking those things in my life, it really empowered me to go back to uh, the fruit of where I first started from and to the getting back to the heart of what I always wanted to do and what I want to do. Because whatever you do is already inside of you. Like I said, I remember at 12 years old, 
counseling with a, with a schoolmate of ours about being sexually abused. And not understanding, I was already doing this at 12 years old. Mm -hmm. And I was counseling people and talking to them how to get through it and how to deal with the situation, how to problem as a kid. But it wasn't me, it was just what was already in me. That was with me, it was lying dormant in me, preparing me for I'm already about to go. Mm -hmm. And then when I did that, it brought me joy to bring that help to someone else. But then also, too, you have to find a place to also help yourself in general, to make you look at yourself. Mm -hmm. and, and then find your own flaws. And then when you find those things and you, 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 you settle in and say, you know what, this is who I am. Because that's the greatest thing to stop lying to yourself. Oh, man. <clears throat> that's it there. That, that, that's it there. Are you at 6 o'clock? No, 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 no. Not, uh, not in the close, but I was, let me... Okay, so we, well, what else you got? I got everything memorized. Oh, no, yeah, there's another thing was before, uh, I don't know, it's, it's like being in a difficult place. It's like uh, I joined the fellowship because I thought I lived there for a reason. And then, like, when I first got there, uh, I met with the pastor and everything. It was like, Wonderful. It was like, hey man, I'm glad for you to be here, this and that. And then uh, we met, and he was like, I was like, yeah, this is my background, this is my past, this is what I've been through. And he was like, hey, you know, I want you to be a part of my leadership team, I want you to meet with these guys, I want you to start your ministries, I want you to, to uh, work, or run a group for me, and I want you to get your speaking gifts up and going, and we're going to focus on that, and we're going to get you back speaking. And I'm like, okay, sounds good. Then Hurricane Harvey hit, and it was a situation where they needed help in different areas of the church to get food together, to put packages out, mm -hmm. and they're doing food runs. They did a lot of amazing things. And when I went there, I just started serving and, and helping and, and do these things. He told me, hey man, just interact with these people, let them know who you are, and things of that nature, and be a part of it. And I get so much that uh, told me once people say, hey, work more if you need some prayer or anything else like that, I'll pray with you. Whatever you may need, anytime you need, just let me know. Mm -hmm. right. So we go meet him with him again, and I can, I feel people. I just, I feel the, their energy. I feel the, the, uh, who they are. And that's another, another thing about energy. That's a whole other conversation mm -hmm. that, that, that we can have. But it's, it's hard in the spiritual world mm -hmm. to talk about those things. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Not for me. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, and so I went and talked to him. We had this whole great conversation. I got relieved. I said, hey, before I get ready to go, Pastor, this feels like something's troubling me. Like, you have something on your mind you need to tell me. And he's like, oh. Well, since you said that, I said, man, it's okay to tell me whatever you think could come on your chest. Well, I just want to tell you that uh, here at the fellowship, uh, we don't have titles. And this, I'm like, what titles? Are you talking about? Did you tell somebody you're you're a, a reverend? I said, I said, yeah, you the one who told me <laughs> to go in Iraq and tell these people. I'm part of this and you remember that. I said, I said, can I tell you the truth? He's like, well, huh, at this church, we don't have no titles. I don't call anybody pastor. I don't even call myself pastor. We don't do titles here, this and that. And I just want to let you know that uh, if you, there's, I don't want you to start thinking you're just going to come up here and start speaking on Sunday mornings. I'm like, okay, sure, buddy, okay. And I said, can I tell you something? He's like, uh, what? I said, I don't care about a title. I said, I never ever asked for a title. I said, when even when I became a pastor, I never asked for the title. I said, titles don't mean anything to me. I said, I only told those people that so in case they needed prayer. They knew that they try, hey, I'm a man of God. If you wanted somebody to pray for you, I'm not just mm -hmm. some old schmo from off the corner. You just say, hey, just say, hey, I'm just here. And I said, I don't care about a title. He's like, Oh, I, I didn't I didn't know that I just I said, Well you never talked to me 
about it. I said, but you felt some type of way. And I said, I'm okay, we're good. And ever since then, I've always had like this vibe that just was uneasy. And I came and said, God, I'm ready to move me. Mm-hmm. But then every time you're ready to move, it says something stay be still. Mm-hmm. Like it's it's a learning. I'm about to teach you something inside of this. Don't worry about him, because you can't deal with him. I'll deal with him. And I know that. I've just been, been just learning. Because even though his period or whatever that, he's a great, great, great minister, great preacher, but whatever it is, it's it's that mentality of Saul of, I think I own this. <laughs> And so many men in, in this body are so attached to their, 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 their four corner walls of, the, of a church house. And they feel like, <laughs> Ooh. like they feel like that is theirs. But the child in them who started off and just wanted to serve God, say, God, this is yours. But then after they start getting their tidings and they, <laughs> this is how they live, and then they live off of the tidings of the church, and then now this is how they pay their bills, and this is how they now they feel like this is their ownership. Mm-hmm. And they don't like anything that might disrupt it. And then when he see my leadership, it scared him. Like, who's this guy? Because when I start doing the food drive, I'm like, hey, you guys, this is what we're going to do. This, 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 and that, this is what we're going to do. So when he seen it, he was like, hold on, who's this guy who's helping and directing these people who've been going to my church? But this is what you asked me to be a part of your church. And I told you it comes with, with leadership. I, but you didn't th- know it was real leadership. <laughs> and it scared him. And it's like, well, my God, is I supposed to be here? Because I don't want to be underneath anything that's harmful. But I've been learning, too. Because also, too, is sometimes you have to be in a place of humbleness that sometimes you can still learn from something that you might not understand or you might think is because even with David, he was still learning from Saul, even though he was in a place that soon he would take a position. But David didn't just start off the king, even when he was already anointed to be who he's supposed to be, he still had to come into a place of, of, of learning. And, and it gradually took time, and then when it became, took full range, he knew what not to do and what to do, and it built his character in general. But from that, on Saturday, Sunday, what he did was he had, uh, like seven ministers came up there, but they were the real ministers, people from the church. Oh yeah, then he caught me off guard too. Then the next Sunday, he had the nerve to sit there in front of the congregation. It was like an older couple in there. I'm like, this is pastor such and such. And we honor them for all their pastoral services. And at this church, they're still called pastor. And I'm like, what did you just tell me? <laughs> Ain't no titles. Ain't no titles in this church. <laughs> Boy, I must. I was like, my head was like this. I was like, really? Like, school. Did <laughs> <laughs> you just tell me the church? Ain't no, ain't no titles. Let's back up real quick. Hey, now, for sure, we you need to all of you, but in this case, you, but all of you need to listen when the universe is talking. We tend not to do that. Now, I don't know why. I can think of ten to twelve reasons why, but why that I would be wrong, I'd be right, but then I'd be wrong in the individualistic reason of why you or why we don't listen as individuals. Someone just randomly spoke over you, the way you said it, people will only call you like they see you. So it's a lesson I learned from my dad. Um, I haven't learned too many lessons, but it's a lesson I learned from my dad. He visited him in prison one day and People, I said, man, people are calling me this and this, and it was good stuff. It was, it was good stuff. They're calling me pastor and all that stuff. I don't like that. And he said, slow down. People are only going to call you how they see you. And I was like, whoa, okay. I guess that does make a little sense. And 
else it does. But I hated it, but it does make a little sense. I'm going to say the same thing to you. You got this, you say you're two months pregnant. Nobody can see it. And I would say you're two months pregnant in the middle of a 90-month pregnancy. It's going to take way more than nine months to get to your highest expression of yourself. Not that it takes a long time, because time doesn't really work the way it is. It's just one of those journeys you get to enjoy for what we perceive to be a while. In saying that, yeah, listen, and if you know it and random strangers know it, boom, time to start doing it. Not when you get the money, not when the conditions are perfect, you just go. Because the whole time you were talking, I'm not sure if it was evident to you, but you keep learning new things. You keep getting newness because you keep moving forward. Moving forward solves all problems. Well, I don't know what to do next. Just move forward and the next will be shown to you. Or you'll hit a wall and then you gotta figure it out. You know what I'm saying? You gotta, you gotta figure it out. So kudos is you're having these conversations. Pretty soon you're gonna start getting staffed. Pretty soon volunteers are gonna show up. If well if you're moving forward, you're going to start getting staff. You know, volunteers are going to show up. People are going to say, hey, man, I really believe in it, which is why I brought this up. Because you said the guy said he just believes in business. And you and him are supposed to be linked up on a business level. And that's probably true. And you're going to get you're going to get your tempests. Mm -hmm. You're going to get your graces and Deanna's and Shannon's. And this is going to come. And it won't be who you expect. It'll be who you need. At all times. Amen. It'll also be <laughs> to the level of your self esteem, too. Okay? It'll also be that. Now, you have to do two things. You have to grow out to where you can handle anything that's coming, right? You have to do that. And then you'll actually have to give the people that you're being staffed with a voice. And let me tell you how hard that is for a leader. <laughs> you know, I thought they had a girl, I don't know what she, she said the same thing. I think you always right. I don't want to be right. The universe just made it that way. And then, then when you don't listen, then I have to do be that person to tell you, I told you so. I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. Well, you definitely don't want to tell people, you told them so. That's, I told you so. Those are the four most abusive like, words in the English language. They really are. They're quite abusive. <laughs> they really are. But when you get them, you have to give them a voice. This means that they have to disagree with you. All the music can't be your favorite. All the food can't be your favorite. And it kills me. People be like, hey, I'm, I'm going to be diverse. Okay. I got all these colors in my whatever organization, when you look at the staff and it's all white men and it's not even, there's not even diversity in the white menness of it. It is 60 year old white men. You, you, you didn't even sprinkle a 30 year old in there somewhere. That's not diverse. That is an illusion of diversity, which is the illusion of you have a voice here, but you don't. Because if there is an issue that affects your gender or your age group, old people are going to vote on it. Mm -hmm. And it's just, it's just not going to work. It is the exact reason why I make money. Because old people are so rigid in their ways. Now that they're all finding out, holy crap. I'm not living in the world I once dominated. And their money is running short. Now it is. I need one of these young guys to come keep me abreast of this. <coughs> so just remember that. As you go, you move, you're gonna you're gonna get staffed. When you get staffed, you're gonna have to be able to handle giving them a voice. Hard for this and it's really hard for spiritual leaders the most. 
It's so hard for spiritual leaders. In my experience, spiritual leaders have the hardest time giving people a voice. It, 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 it's, I, I have a guess to why. This is now an opinion. I would get out of universal law. This is now an opinion. Since the spiritual leader is so high up, I'm using that in a kind of sitting manner, and then he's so high up that he can hear the voice of God that orders come from the top down, not bottom up. <laughs> and what happens is they know best in all situations, even in areas and departments they have no expertise in. I know what this should look like. How? You don't even... You better not use your cell phone. You're telling me what to do in the media. How do you even possibly know what this should look like? You have no expertise here. Well, you're a woman. You're a weaker vessel. How? The last time I checked, I ain't giving birth to nobody. Let me just tell you. Forget the science of it. <clears throat> if I could, I, don't know, said I would. Let me just tell you. If I could, I would. If, if somehow, if tomorrow we can give birth, <laughs> I'm done before I ever start. Just, just, just remember those things because the leader that refuses to listen to his people will eventually be surrounded by people who have nothing to say. Andy Stanley said that. And the last, well, the second to last thing. Then you're going to have to be ready to get crucified by these people. I'm going to keep that but that is how it works, though. You have to be able to take lumps without you getting personal. Without you getting personal. You got to take the lumps. You don't get to be unstable. Not not us. Not, not any leader. Not nobody in this room. Everybody in this room is leaders of people. We don't get to be unstable. When we coach people, they get to be unstable. We don't get to vibrate at their frequency. She's a counselor. She doesn't get to panic like the people she counseled. Somebody got to be stable. Somebody got to be stable. That was basically it from everything you said. I went in order this time. I didn't go backwards. Basically everything you said, but I do have one more thing. Anybody guess what it is? I said one more thing too. Yes, you did. Go ahead. I didn't know if you wanted to go. Ahead. No, go ahead. Thing, I'm thinking of my thing. Well, you know. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> they got it. They got it. They got it. Oh, do, do, do. Be you <laughs> set it up so perfectly. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, <laughs> wait. <laughs> she just, I just got talking. it. <laughs> oh, she on. just got it. I had a slow moment. Do, do, do. I'm sorry, I had a slow moment. How long would it okay. take you to get back, back to the Oh, point? I would have never been able to do that. There was no 20 years now, that that's the only time it's ever going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> no, no guy's ever going to say, your thing is bigger than my thing. It's never going to happen. Okay. <laughs> I had to take the timing. The timing was perfect. I had to. Had to there was no way it was going to happen again. There was no way it was going to happen again. Okay. All right, go ahead. <laughs> okay, so now this is my, my other thing. That I, I seen, I done this with Pastor Thomas and them when we did our outreach over here in the uh, in the open field. When we did it, we did uh, like different people speaking for seven seven minutes, or whatever it may be. And so in church on Sunday, that's what they did. And so I've been in my spirit lately. Just I've been thinking about doing. Podcast, didn't know how to do a podcast. So I said, well, let me sit down with Tony one day and just ask him how to do a podcast. And then I was like, you know what? I was speaking to another friend. I was like, hey, maybe I can do every Tuesday and Thursday and be like testimony, testimony Tuesday, testimony Thursday. And then like I was coming to that epiphany today when I was driving. And I was like, you know what? People's attention span is very, very, very short. And I was like, if I wanted to really impact, it really just start a foundation of myself as I'm building, building my momentum for what I want to do. 
as a formula of making myself relevant mm -hmm. to the momentum of what I'm already trying to do. And then when I get into everything, all my pieces put together, I think it'd be even a larger acceptment of what I'm doing as I build the body of work. And I want to do like a seven minute segment each week of one small topic that in that seven minutes, I just pour out everything and just put it online, whatever it may be, whatever the topic may be, or come up with quite a few and then just dropping them on YouTube or wherever it might be your social outlet it may be and just getting it out there and build my own feed, build my own response of but also being therapeutic in general too of what I feel or things that have been built up inside of me mm -hmm. in, in general. And uh, like in general, like I had one that I spoke to uh, one of the guys that I was in time. Nah, you're right. Nah, go ahead. Oh, yeah. Got, got six minutes to, to, to the business. Six, six, six minutes, Slim Shady, you're on. Oh, on, on, on. Okay. And so, y'all don't get these jokes. Yeah. Nah, that's all right. It's, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's just like this. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> What'd you say with that smart? I'm just eating my hot spice. Uh -huh. uh -huh. The good reverend. Uh -huh. <laughs> okay, uh -huh. so. Uh -huh. And so this is something that 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 also I met a man too. I, I had a man. joke there. I, mean, I had a joke yeah. with there, but I, I figured I got that one. Come on. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but when I was talking to my son about because we meet every Monday, uh, a couple of guys from the fellowship, and we have a, a Monday meeting, and I had to meet the gentleman, and I was telling that my grandfather had property, and I'm a power attorney with my grandmother's father, and all his properties. And I told me we had a property over here in Doosan, Louisiana, that uh, Texaco oil, and they've been sending him the same small little check for years. And then he ended up giving me knowledge that there's actual a thing called farmers. And I'm like, farmers? I know farmers insurance. He said, no, there's an actual farmers group that what they do is that so many farmers back in the days had land, and then when the oil industry started hitting so big in Texas, Louisiana area, that these big oil companies are drilled under their lands and taken through the minerals. My grandfather owns the minerals uh, for his land and they'll give them a little bit of profit. And I give them a little bit of profit for so long and they don't have enough education to know what their property is really worth mm -hmm. and the minerals are worth are going underneath them. And so the man said, hey man, I'm gonna give you these people information from farmers. He said, I just wanted to know one thing. He said, you have any kids? I was like, yeah. He said, all you need to know is by the time you finish, how are you going to spend your money and what college your kids want to go to? Okay. Well, you need to jump on that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you need to jump on that. You need to j jump on that for sure. When you talk about the podcast, yeah. next time, I'm going to bring in the Dean Marie group because they are experts at Ooh. podcasts. Yeah. They are. They are. The Dean Marie group right there. Right there. Yeah, yeah. That's them. Ooh. They are experts at podcasting. And I, and I think I have uh, one that I want to start off with. I love my ladies. These beautiful ladies. Keep on feeling like James Brown. And my first one that I love to do, like I was telling the man right there, is it's called PB and J. Okay. And PB and J, no PB and J. Peanut butter and jelly. jelly. But no, but PB and J stands for P stands for the process. The B stands for the lesson, and the J stands for the journey. Okay, you're definitely a preacher. That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, but, but it also intertwines with every part of life because everybody wants the blessing, but nobody wants to go through the process. Oh, that's fair. And then the greatest thing is, even when you get the blessing, you don't understand there's a still a journey that comes along the way. That's good. That's good. And you make your perfect sandwich. Yeah. You gotta have the process first. Yeah. I mean, that's, okay, that's good. That's good. That's good. No, that's good. Well, these two just created two podcasts, and one, two of them, they created with two, both of them have a hundred episodes apiece. So they they're pretty, pretty efficient with that. They start off with high, let's just say high productivity, and then yeah. So they, they anyway, they're gonna. I'll let them explain the process to you. It's the ATS companies have a lot of stuff going on. Let them explain the process to you. 
and I can't help myself but to say we've got four top ranked podcasts on all of iTunes. I can't help myself. I just can't help it. I, mean, I just can't help it. Tempest Smith actually is the number one of all of them. Her podcast outperforms everyone's. It's overcoming low self esteem and it is changing the world. So appreciate you, ma'am. Don't forget, next time you come back, the Marie Group will be with me. Well, they'll be here again and then they will walk you through podcasting. And, and we'll, we'll all walk you through. I'll give you some tips and they give you some tips. And then we'll make you rich. Yay. <laughs> appreciate you, man. <laughs>